We're going to be joined by, oh, I see her right here, uh, Robin Thompson of Castle Mark Wealth Management and Elizabeth Namofsky of uh, Caldwell Securities. Hello, I see her right here. We're going to go live because we've got so much to talk about and not enough time. So give us a second here. Let's see. And folks, do not, you know, there's Elizabeth. How's it going? Hi. Can you hear me loud and clear? Absolutely. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear perfectly. We passed the check check. We're good. We're good. <laughs> We're just waiting for Robin here. I'm just checking to see if she's on. Let's just double check. Boom. Just sent her an invite. But how are you doing? I'm well. I've been looking forward to this. Counting down. Good. There's Robin. Hey, Robin. Hi, ladies. How are you? Good, good. Good, how are you? Good. You look well, ladies. Wonderful. Honestly, this is great. We all passed our check. This is fantastic. <laughs> we'll take it, right? Right on. Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you? I'm well. How are you, Robin? Good. It's nice to see your $5 every day. I'm watching it. I'm like, wow, it's such a great initiative. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's something that we're going to be talking about today, actually. It is definitely a question on the table for us. There's so much to cover, actually. And I know we've got till 2.30, but I'm just going to dive right in and let folks know that if you have any questions at all, please feel free to include them in the comment box or the little Q&A on the far bottom right corner of your screen. We'll address them at the end for sure. Uh, but diving in, honestly, uh, Financial Literacy Month. It's such a big month for folks to talk and, and basically open up the conversation that really need to be had um, and all year round, not just during November, really. Uh, but you know what? We're, today we're going to be talking about uh, the essentials of saving and investing. So I want to kind of start by talking about investing. And I mean, this question's for you. Okay. So <laughs> I'm just going to. So for folks, you know, that haven't really invested before, it could be a bit overwhelming. You know, mm -hmm. what am I investing? Am I over investing? how do I go about it? You know, so a lot of people have began to start like investing, especially in the past two years, because, you know, COVID really struck the conversation about financial literacy and the importance of, of investing and whatnot. So what are your tips and tricks for folks who are looking to invest to starting or those who already began, but don't feel like they're doing it right? Well, I think that, you know, first of all, you're absolutely right. And I think that during periods of disruption of which we've gone through in COVID in 2019 and 2020 into 2021, when things get shaken up, people take a step back and kind of take a look at where they are and they take stock of their life, not just from a health perspective, but also from a money perspective. So when you think about investing, and again, we're in financial literacy month, and I think the foundation of this conversation is to understand what is investing and what is that basic building block and investing essentially is an investing in assets that you think are going to grow or have price appreciation so they're going to grow beyond the current value and you're going to make the difference in income and in, in capital there the next one is income so you can also invest for income so if you're retired and you're looking to generate income off of your portfolio your characteristics or why you're investing is different than if you're looking for capital appreciation. So when you're investing, you can invest in all sorts of things. So stocks, bonds, ETFs, mutual funds. You can also invest in hard things such as the real estate or individual companies. But the point is that you're going to be investing in something that you believe is going to have price appreciation. So you're going to make a profit. So when you start investing, one of the first things to figure out is, you know, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Like, are you looking to save money for education for your children? Are you looking to buy a house? Are you looking for retirement? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? So try to figure out what is the problem you're trying to solve or what is the goal you're trying to get to? And then from there, take a step back and have an understanding of, you know, what am I trying to do? So how do I really get there? How much do I need to invest? How much do I need to save? What does that look like on a regular basis? And then start to put some of those pieces together. So looking at a broad based asset allocation, which essentially is how you invest your money over into different buckets. So again, stocks, fixed income, equities, real estate. So where do each of the different pieces belong so you can continue to invest and grow your wealth? And then once you have an idea of that, then you need to sit down and figure out, how do I do this? Like, what does that mean? Like you said, a lot of people have started to investing over the last little while, especially during COVID. So you need to understand the type of investor you are. Do you want to do it yourself? 
there are lots of platforms and tools for you to be able to go and buy individual securities or ETFs or funds off of individual platforms, self-directed. Um, but in some cases, I find that people continue to want to go to advisors, professional advisors, certified financial planners, people that can give you the advice you need to make the decisions. Because it's not just, you know, looking at one stock and saying, oh, my neighbor brought this or, oh, I wear those shoes or, oh, this is a great stock because I've heard about the stock before. It's about understanding the metrics of the stock itself or the fund and then understanding how do I invest? How much should I invest? Which account should I invest it in? So it really is a big conversation about financial literacy. But the first place to start is to understand investing is to make a profit. The best thing to do is to figure out how much risk you're willing to take and then start to piece it together. And as Elizabeth will talk about too later in the segment is about, you know, this is about investing into financial literacy. And you're not going to know everything at the end of this Instagram live. You're going to have a lot more conversations, but we're at least going to start to scratch the surface. Definitely. I think you made an excellent point. It's just really understanding what kind of investor you are. I think that's really starting there and understanding what your goals and your purpose for this. Like some people just throw the money. Okay. Just make my money, make me more money kind of thing, but not having the purpose or that sense of, okay, here's the goals I want to accomplish and really investing in those with purpose, you know, whether it's real estate, whether whatever it is um, really makes a big difference. It's not just, I put my money in something in a little. Well, we definitely want to make money. So the whole point is appreciation of capital, but oh, let's try to, you know, make sure we're aligning it to a goal. Exactly. Perfect. And, and <coughs> about money and saving and investing and whatnot. And, and you brought it up at the beginning of the call is um, the live rather uh, was the $5 a day challenge. Elizabeth, I love mm -hmm. seeing it on social. I love to see those $5 bills increase all the time. Like I see the little posts. <laughs> talk to you about that little practice here that you have going on. How does something as simple as saving $5 a day um, help <laughs> the long run? So I am going to talk about pre-investing. Robin talked about you know, how to invest, what to do when you're investing. But I'm going to talk about pre-investing because I realized that a lot of people are carrying a lot of debt. And a lot of people think, well, I don't know how to get out of debt. And I don't know how to do this. And it's very difficult. So one morning, I was getting ready to go to work. And I thought, well, I know this was in August of 2019. And I thought, why don't I just do something that'll encourage people to save? $5 a day isn't really that much money in the grand scheme of things. So this is your pre-investing money. This is your emergency fund. This is your help me get out of debt fund. So before you start investing, as Robin was saying, this is, this is your foundation that you're trying to, to build upon. And I thought, you know, month of November, financial literacy month, 30 days, you can save $150. But if you continue doing it for the entire year, it's $1,825. You do it for five years, you've got over $9,000. You do it for 10 years, it's 18,000. Now the key here is, if you say you save $5 a day, but in the, in the interim, you're actually spending $14 a day for lunch. So if you've got $5 a day you're saving, $14 a day you're saving for lunch, in five years, you've saved $34,000. It's a nice down payment on a home or a nice investment amount that you can put into stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, or, or whatever it is. So if you look at the long term and you look at what, what it is, I mean, if you did $5 per day and you save $14 per lunch and a $40, a $40 a week mani petty. In five years, you've saved $43,000, $43,800. So it adds up and it's a simple process, but it's there to let you know that every penny counts. Because Robin, I'm sure as you were growing up, I mean, we, I was picking up pennies off, off the street when people were throwing them on the sidewalk. You know, um, I was raising money for UNICEF with the little orange box through, you know, uh, Halloween, right? So every penny counts. It really does. And I think that's to your point, you know, um, growing up, you know, when you're, when you, when you grow up, your view about money and how you've been raised around money has a direct impact to how you relate to money now and how you spend money or save money. And I think it's important to understand and realize that, you know, we're all going to have an attitude or mindset towards money. And I think that if you have a very, very healthy relationship towards money, great, amazing for you. Most people don't. So it's about understanding that it's okay if you don't know where to start. It's okay if you're starting from the ground level and you're building your way up. 
I mean, I spent, you know, we've had many conversations about this, look at I and different conferences that we've been in. And, you know, I spent a significant amount of my time in the social welfare system when I was growing up. So I understand what it is to come from the bottom and really kind of work your way and grind your way up. But I think it's only by having, like you said, when Elizabeth was talking about was saving a little bit of money here and building that foundation. And, and the key word here is building and compounding the effects that compounding has on your wealth and that ability to be invested and then have the growth compound and compound and compound and compound year over year over year over year is the magic. That is the magic of investing. It's the magic of having time in the market, time for your investments to grow. So start. And if it's that building that emergency fund with $5 a day and having it add up, then it's about taking it one step further and looking at, great, so where do I put that money? Put it into a tax-free savings account. I mean, this calendar year, if you've never contributed to a tax-free savings account back to 2019, you can contribute 75500 Into next year, yep. 81500 is the total because it's another 6000 next year. You could grow all of that money completely tax-free. So no tax, compounding, tax-free, compounding. So all of these little changes that you make into your daily spending habits and all of the foundation that you're building is really what's going to get you where you need to be to have a successful financial life and one that gives you some security and, and, and you're able to also have some fun because it's not just about saving every penny it's also about living early I, too, so yeah. oh absolutely fun is very important but i also want to say robin like everything that you said i mean you and i are always on the same page when we talk about things like this i mean we were financial literacy af af Financial literacy advocates. You're a champion, we let's be honest. You're a financial <laughs> literacy champion. Let's not forget that. Well, you're up there too, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> However, um, you know, we all have the same goal. We want to make sure that Canadians learn and live a good life out of debt and investing their money so that, you know, they can maximize their tax-free savings account or their RSP or whatever it is. But I think it's, in, it's really important to tell people as well, everyone is so keen on having immediate results. Amazon delivers the next day. You can, like everyone's delivering the next day. So you've got this entire generation thinking that I, you know, I'm going to be a millionaire tomorrow or I'm going to do this and I'm going to make a lot of money tomorrow. I mean, investing is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And you need to understand your risk tolerance, as Robin said. And, you know, there's so much more that goes into it. Actually, Elizabeth, you made such a really, like, a really, really good point. And that's just, we live in a, an era where basically everything is just, palm my hand, our hand, here's a click, I get my delivery tomorrow. I'm, I'm guilty. I have, Amazon has just been the most convenient thing ever. But when it comes to money, it goes back to, Robin, what you were saying, that you have to have that healthy relationship with your money and your habits. And that's the time. Those qualities are really essential to basically growing your money or, or building that kind of uh, the growth that you want to see, essentially. Um, yeah, I essentially call it, you know, don't rob from your future self to give to your present self. Ooh, nice. You that's know, that's absolutely because that's, you know, and that's something that you think about because you are, you know, instant gratification. Listen, I'm an Amazon shopper. I think especially during COVID, we've all become Amazon shoppers. It's to the degree you become someone who has to have that instant gratification that becomes a problem. If you can control your budget and spend about 50% of your income on fixed expenses, so things that keep the lights on, so mortgage, rent, car payments, groceries, spend 30% in the discretionary in the discretionary side. If you have more debt, you need to spend less, more money on debt, less on discretionary, and then 20% on savings. Try to figure out that sphere or pie. So you are paying down your debt, you're saving towards the future, you're spending some money on today, but that you're not continually robbing your future self of your of your future goals because you're too wrapped up with you know the immediate gratification or the consumer attitude that we have today because it's you know it's going to hurt you in the long run. Absolutely, I actually, absolutely. I hope folks actually took that away. Like that's a really really good sentence to kind of keep in mind. Um, and going back to the five dollar a day challenge is kind of like your Starbucks. You know, am I going to spend $5 a day on my Starbucks or can I just make it at home? Or, you know, I even had someone once tell me, like, instead of buying $5 a day, just buy the big container from Costco or whatever. Make your wake up early, make your own coffee every day. And that goes a long way. You could spend $15 and make 40 cups instead of spending, you know, $5 a day on your grande. I, I, I bring my lunch to work every day and I make a big carafe of tea. So I drink my water all day long. And I think that, you know, once you get into the system, you get the system into you of just doing it on your own, it's so much easier. And as Robin said, a lot of people want that instant gratification, but that ends up hurting you in the long run. And, you know, with that instant gratification, 
comes a lot of stress and that hurts you in the long run as well. Yeah. And I, you know, I just taking a look at, you know, the, the energy that we've got Instagram living room, as they call it. Uh, there's a lot of that female empowerment too, kind of sitting here. We've got, you know, like, you know, you two are both financial and like literacy, literacy champions, both of you. Uh, and, and talking about the female aspect of things, I want to touch upon that because I know you both have a lot of great tips for uh, women in the industry and women and their money really habits as well. So I kind of want to ask about if there are any financial differences between women that are married, for women that are in partnerships, women that are mothers uh, versus those females that are single. Is there any difference in the way that they spend their money or is there any difference, similarities between them? Do you have any recommendations? And I know Elizabeth, you got a really good story to share too. So Robin, how about you go ahead and give us your tips and-, and sure. <clears throat> So I think that, you know, whenever we have conversations, I'm always about let's set the foundation. Let's actually talk about, you know, what, what's, what's the elephant in the room or what is it that we need to be talking about and what is the problem that we're solving? And when I think about women and wealth, and, you know, I'm an advocacy for women and wealth, I believe that women should be empowered to make their own money, save their own money, have their own money. And when we think about what that means and where we're going in the world, in 2019, women controlled here in Canada about $2.2 billion, $2.2 trillion worth of money. By 2028, that's going to be past $4 trillion. So we're going to see a doubling of money transferring to the hands of women. Whether you're single, whether you're divorced, whether you're widowed, at some point, you will be solely responsible for the financial decisions in your life and in your family's lives. So this isn't a conversation anymore about, oh, you know, my husband takes care of that or my partner takes care of that or maybe I'll get to that someday. No. I mean, this is the time that women need to stand up and take this point of disruption and allow it to be something that works for you in, in your favor. And this is about looking at it and understanding. So if I'm single, what are the challenges that I have? At some point, ladies, we are all going to be single. It's actually 80% of men in Canada will die married, which means there's a significant amount of people who are married that you are now going to have to manage what your household finances look like. Do you know how to control a budget? Do you know what your investments are? You know, God forbid something happens earlier on in life. Do you have enough insurance to make sure that you're taking care of your children are taken care of? Do you have your wills and your powers and attorney powers of attorney in place? Do you have an understanding of where all of your investments and assets are? So sometimes I think people get confused with financial literacy or investing and think it's only about the stock market. It's only about, you know, getting in on that next hot tip. It's not financial literacy and for women in general and, and across the board is about having an understanding of what is in your, you know, what is in the box. What do you have in the box? How do you make sure that what you have is enough? Because that's the question I get all the time is, am I going to be okay? Do I have enough? Am I gonna run out of money? And that is really what I hear over and over and over, men or women. So if you're single, you need to plan for an extended period of time being alone. If you're looking towards the future, you need to take into account healthcare costs. As we age, obviously healthcare costs will increase. Um, you know, what does your income look like if there is a shift in income between partners, if they're in the event of, of a divorce or, or being widowed? You know, what are the different financial? Oh, Robin, you're frozen. So you can continue to live your life. So if I may add to that, Robin, you gave really, really amazing points and they're all true, 100%. The other thing too is women make 87 cents to the dollar. Yep. Huge gap. Women live longer than men. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that the 87 cents that we make on the dollar lasts longer than the dollar that the man makes. Plus women also have a very disruptive workforce. You start working, you get married, you have a child, you stop working, then you have to get back into the workforce again. Maybe you have another child, maybe your parents are ill. Something happens where it pulls you back again. And you have to realize that, you know, whatever money that you're making less than your male counterpart, you need to make it last a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And the other thing too is as women, yes, you know what? I'm a firm believer that when, if you're married, you still have to have your own bank account. Mm -hmm. You still have to have your own money and understand how that works. The other thing is, you know, I talk to a lot of women and they always ask me, you know, how do I advocate for myself in the boardroom? I think the more important thing is you need to advocate for yourself outside of the boardroom. Here's an example. I had a, a roof that was leaking. I called a guy to come in. He came in. Here I am, a single woman at the time. I had to take him up to one of the bedrooms. So I'm in this bedroom with a single, with a guy, single woman. Um, and he says, well, I've got to go up into your attic. So I said, okay, I'm going up with you. And he said, well, what do you mean? 
I said, what's my house? It's one of the rooms I've never been in. So I'm going up there with you. So I climbed into the attic and I'm crawling through the attic and he's telling me how disastrous my roof is. So when we come down and we're standing in the bedroom again, I said to him, so how much do you think, just an estimate, what do you think this is going to cost me? And he said, $40,000. And I said, that's a bit excessive for a roof, don't you think? And he said, well, you work on Bay Street, you can afford it. And I said, wait a minute, well, how do you know that about me? He said, well, I've seen you on TV before. I said, it doesn't matter where I work. It doesn't matter where I live. I do not have a separate bank account for you with $40,000 sitting in there waiting for me to hand it over to you. So I said, what you're going to do is you're going to break that $40,000 into three parts. Part one, what I need to do immediately. Part two, what I can do, you know, a month or two from now. And part three, maybe a year from now. And I never heard back from him again. So we need to ask questions. Questions are very important in order to protect our money. It's asking questions and asking the right questions too. Like it's always, to, you know, being assertive too. I like the fact that you're like, actually, hold on a second. <laughs> like, I, I really like that. And that's the kind of energy we need to kind of have as, as, as women in wealth. You basically kind of uh, asking the right questions and not being taken advantage of as well. Because we've heard a lot of those stories and we've heard the conversations around that as well. Uh, women need to be more financially literate and actually know what's going on with their with their finances, especially to the fact that you, you shared, Robin, the four point what was it 4.4 trillion it's going to be over 4 trillion by 2028 so the significant wealth transfer and if you think about wealth transfer it's you know generational wealth transfer so we're seeing it going from spouse to spouse so in general women in canada tend to live about four to six years longer than their husbands that's not taken into consideration that sometimes you know women marry older husbands which widens that gap to 10 to 15 years so there's a longer time that women need to be able to be self-supporting for themselves but it's also then transition of wealth from you know, spouse to spouse, but then it's mother to daughter or it's granddaughter, daughter to, da to daughter. So there's so many different transitions of wealth. Money is in motion and money is in motion with women. And this is the time where you need to look at it and say, okay, so this is coming. How do we manage ourselves now? So again, we're setting ourselves up for our future self to have success. We're setting ourselves up so that we're not being taken advantage. We're asking questions about our roof, our home, our equity, our investment properties. You know, this is, you know, the days of women not being financially sound and financially literate, they're gone. So, I mean, this is a time where we step up and we take our power because it's always been there for us to take. It's just a question of having the courage to have the conversation. And there is no wrong question. There is no wrong conversation. The fact that you're having the conversation is exactly where you need to be. But understand, you don't need to do it yourself. So reach out and get some help. We know, I know that we're going to talk a bit more about that. But I think it's having that clarity of vision to say, mm, Spidey senses are going off. Something's not right here. Where do I pivot to? What do I do? And I just want to add to that too, Robin, because yes, we have always been in charge, but we've always decided to step back a little bit. And I think it's important for us, as I said, to ask the questions. My mother always said, if you don't ask, you don't know. And no question is stupid or offside. Questions are really good, actually, because it gets the brain going. But I had somebody say to me, you know, I think you need to dumb down uh, the conversations when you're speaking to people because um, it's not fun and finance isn't fun for me. So I'm not going to understand it. But I think we have to jump in with both feet and start understanding finance. You don't have to be a CFA or a financial guru. As Robin said, we're there to answer questions, ask all the questions, but don't be afraid of money. Money should be your friend. And money should not be stressful either. And it's about that engagement. Engage with your money. I mean, I think, you know, women generally are, are, tend to look at financial websites less. They tend to read less financial literature, watch less financial television. You know, this is the time to change that. So engage with your money. And I think that when you find, when you do engage and you do have a conversation and you have some peace of mind about your money and where your money is going, your life will change and strides because you will now have a sense of control. You'll have a sense of purpose. You will be someone who is financially literate, contributing to yourself, your family, your communities, and you will you will live a life stronger because of the courage that you've taken to be able to understand how to navigate through the world of finance. And it's not something that that is um, difficult to do. It's something that just requires some courage. It requires you to step up and again have those conversations. And I feel like Elizabeth and I have had a lot of chats during this call about. 
during this live about, you know, ask the questions. And it's really about that and, and how, how can we help you? But it's always about, you know, what is the problem that I'm trying to solve? Where is it that I'm trying to get to and not get lost in the instant gratification of, I need to buy all of these things now and spend my money here because, you know, Amazon is delivering to my door. And, you know, that is, it's, it's something that we need to, that we need to look at and understand is there, but put some self, put some boundaries around what that looks like and what you're willing to, what you're willing to sacrifice tomorrow for today for. Yeah. Great. Definitely. When you, you know, basically Amazon and, and really a lot of other things, I know we're just mm -hmm. Amazon, but you know, it's, it's basically when you get that instant gratification, okay, that one day, oh, great. It's already here. You become to have this expectation where it's just like anything that takes longer or anything that takes time is just too much time. It just mm -hmm. becomes, I can't wait. I have no more patience because so many things I get, you know, it, it, we, it's, you know, the time that we're living in is very interesting, actually. And, and there are some practices that we should really hold on to. Uh, and I want to touch upon this a bit. And it's, you know, digital literacy. There's so many apps out there. There's so many different platforms that have basically made us, okay, let's sit down and just let it do the math for us. Let it just do everything for us. And we don't have to sit there and, and track anything. But there are some practices that we used to have that are hold on to, such as, you know, having your credit card statement. Uh, Elizabeth, can you touch upon that a bit and why it's healthy to still get a physical copy? I think it's really important to look at your credit card statement every single solitary month. Take a look at it. What's on there? This is a great diary of your spending habits, right? Um, at the beginning of COVID, I was looking at my credit card statement and I noticed that um, my alarm company had almost doubled the price had almost doubled from when I had signed up. So I called them up and I said, listen, I, this is not what I signed up for. I still have this really old draconian alarm system, but you know, you guys are charging me double now. So I asked the questions and spoke to them. And basically I got a brand new state of the alarm, uh, state of the art alarm system. And the price went back down to half again. So advocate for yourself, ask the questions. The other thing too is, how many people during COVID subscribe to free subscriptions? Mm -hmm. When those free subscriptions expire and you've given them your credit card, if you haven't really canceled it, they're still going to charge you every month. So look at your credit card statement. Are you paying for something that you've actually canceled? How many months have gone by? Have you been paying for an extra year? And what about scams and fraud? You should look at those statements to make sure that no one has stolen your credit card and charging you a monthly something or, you know, put some sort of a big purchase on there that, you know, you wouldn't really understand. Mm -hmm. So credit card statements are very, very important and they will tell you and guide you into which direction you should go. Absolutely. Rob, do you have anything to add to that actually? Because, you know, I, I still get my credit card statements in print to be honest. The difference between seeing it digitally versus, you know, holding it physically and actually through it to see what's what's missing yeah, I mean, listen, I, I am a I'm a paper editor so I love to you know whenever I get a statement or I get something I take my pen and my highlighter and I circle and go through and tick down like you know box checker right over here I'm a box checker so <laughs> um, so it's just about making sure that I'm crossing those T's and you know there's definitely times during COVID or during different periods of times where your life gets busy and you fall off the track of keeping of being so vigilant with it if that's the case, get back on the track, get back on what you're spending. Because, you know, as Elizabeth talked about in the original part of this, of this chat was that, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, saving your money, whether it's, you know, whether it's the $5 day challenge, if you can find an extra 40, 50, 60, $100 or $200 that are being spent on things that you're not using, you know, and that can then go towards your emergency fund or go into investing, you know, that is really where the power is. Because, you know, when we talk about money and we talk about investing, and we talk about savings, which is, you know, the purpose of this, of this IG is that, you know, the number one besides taxes, which is the number one erosion of wealth, the other sort of killer is inflation. So if you're looking at expenses that you're buying that you're not receiving, inflation is going to take a piece of your money just by eroding itself. So if you're sitting in cash, as an example, you know, 10 years ago, your thousand dollars would now be worth $775 because inflation, the power of inflation and the erosion of your purchasing power is going to diminish your dollar just by doing nothing or just by sitting in cash. So if you can imagine, you're now eroding your principal based on inflation, you are having a credit card where your interest rate is anywhere from 19 to 23%, eating more into your net worth. The op it's the opposite of investing and saving. It is debt uncontrolled. So make sure that what you are purchasing on your cards are actually, in fact, your purchases. You're paying off your statements at the end of each month. If you can't pay them off, don't buy it. And then make sure that when you're looking towards the market, 
you know, it's the opposite of instant gratification. It's the long game. It's consistency time after time after time. It's like a drip, you know, when you have one of those annoying faucets that drips and just the water keeps coming down. That's what this is, you know, it's that long game. And I think that as soon as you can wrap your head around, the earlier, earlier you start not having it in cash, understanding that the markets are not the terrifying, scary place that everybody thinks they are because women tend to think that the markets are terrifying. They're not. They're just about making sure you stay within your risk tolerance to make sure that you're taking that one step further, eliminating any credit card debt that's not there, you know, looking at things that you're not spending money on, but then understanding that any of those dollars that are kind of sitting there, they're not being used, are being wasted. And the true waste is you're losing the time in the market. You're losing the time of having your money work for you because you're essentially just, mm, I'm not going to look at it today because I don't feel like it. Like that is just a poor excuse for financial literacy. So start there, start at the bottom, check your statements, get a highlighter. And a pen. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I want to talk about statements too, very quickly on the side of the statement, it'll say to you, if you only pay the minimum, it will take you this amount of time to pay off the statement. As Robin said, pay off your credit cards every single solitary month. Do not pay the minimum. It's If you purchase something for about $1,000, I think it'll take you five or seven years to pay it off if you only pay the minimum. And, and back in 2019, I got married, and the last portion of our wedding was the booze portion, which was $13,000. <laughs> our friends like to party. Uh, <laughs> but I looked at the credit card statement, and it said, if you pay... The minimum, which was $10, it would take me 108 years and nine months or something. So, I mean, it's a long-term commitment. As I said, um, statements, credit card statements, will tell you a lot about now and a lot about your future. No, no, I and I think that, you know, and I agree, but, you know, so if you are in that place and, you know, and, you know, earlier on in my life, I got stuck in that place where, you know, you kind of went a little too far in your cards, you know, you're like, okay, so how do I pay this off? The balance at the end is too big. Like, how am I going to manage this? And then you get stuck in this like rotation of not being able to pay off those bills. You know, if that happens, make sure that you're getting some, you're getting some counseling, especially as it relates to those high credit card bills, because the interest rates, you know, 22, 23, 30%. You're not going to get under, you're not going to come out from underneath that unless you get some counseling. So take a look at perhaps if you have access to a line of credit that the interest rate's only 4%, you know, borrow at 4%, pay off 22, and then put a program together to start pay down that debt. So, you know, make sure that when you are looking at it, if you are in a place and you're watching this live and that those numbers are too large, um, don't try to think you have to go through this yourself and figure it out on your own. Make sure you're reaching out and you're getting some help. There's lots of people that can give you counseling around how to get your debt under control because debt is that silent eater that's going to take away from your future self. So, you know, again, the credit card statements are important. Looking at, looking at your bank balances, know, know where your money is going. It's pretty self-explanatory. If you're spending more money than you're making, you're always going to live below the line. You're going to live below the line. So stop doing that. It's pretty clear. <laughs> just make the decision to stop doing that. And then you, know, you sound like me. Just stop doing just that. Stop. Like just stop doing it. Like it's not, it's not that complicated. It's not really like people think it's that complicated. I know. Just spend less than you make and save the difference and pay down your debt. So, and again, it's going to take some time to build up that resiliency, the financial resiliency that you need. But you know, it's, you know, the best time to start was yesterday. Mm. So start now. Yeah. yeah. I, I just want to basically, you ladies are phenomenal. And I know we've dipped into our time a bit, but I, I want to say, I think at the core of this live here is the fact that we need to ask the right questions and that knowledge power, but that power is only power. Like we only get that power when we apply that knowledge that we have. And there's been so much to take away from this live. And I hope folks were taking notes. And if not, don't worry, this is going to be replayed on our Instagram live and on the financial advice for all website, because honestly, there's, there's a lot of things that we don't really think about when it comes to this. And, and it's, you know, ask the question, ask the right questions and, and go in search of, you know, those goals. Like you, you want to have, you want to achieve certain things, start there. And the best to your point, Robin, the best time to start was yesterday. Start now. Yeah. And I like, just stop. I, I think that one for me just kind of, <laughs> yeah. when you're going too far, just stop. Yeah. Just stop. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, you know, hard stop right there. Yeah. But, so, but, and don't convince yourself otherwise, because it's easy to have conversations with yourself about why you need things and that instant gratification world that we live in. But wealth is the opposite of instant gratification. It's the long game. Discipline. Yeah. Instant gratification is a killer. Oh, yeah. honey. I was about to say, you know, yeah. sometimes something in your car, I don't know if it happens to you, but, and then you don't purchase it, but then they send you an email, like, Hey, you forgot something. Mm -hmm. And it's just that temptation, that constant 
motivation. And I think it's just having that discipline, uh, discipline, having a bit of patience, as we said, and, you know, let that, let that faucet drip, but drip with like, you know, one penny at a time. Yeah. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't spend. I mean, we work hard to, to live our lives. So, but keep it within reason. You know, if you want to have that big purchase that you're looking at, or you've seen those things online and it's something that you want to have, then make the purchase, but make it an intentional purchase. Don't make it a, you know, it's Sunday afternoon and I'm lying on the couch watching Netflix, scrolling through Club Monaco or wherever it is that you're shopping, you know, like have it be an intentional purchase. Again, we all you know, like to buy things online and we like to look at shiny things. I know I do, but, you know, keep it within this, this spectrum or the part of your budget that, that gives you that permission. So within that 30% that you have allocated towards your discretionary expenses, how much you're going to spend on your, you know, your impulsive purchases and leave it within that bracket. And if it goes beyond that, then stop or let that money come into the next month and then next month buy that purchase that you want. So live your life. You have to live your life, but don't live it so hard that you are living in regret or drowning in debt or not paying attention to your life ahead of you because the life is ahead of you. It's coming at you no matter what. So yeah, no, for my sure. father always, my father always said, uh, my parents were immigrants when they came to Canada, they came with uh, a suitcase, $120. They were married less than a year. didn't speak the language, no family, didn't, didn't know anyone here. And my father always said to me, cash is King. If you can't afford it, don't buy it. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't think about anymore because of the whole instant gratification. And the key is, I mean, everybody wants instant gratification, but that will get you into trouble. And what you want to do is save your money so that you can invest it so that you'll have it for that instant gratification time. And it won't make a dent in your bank account. For sure. And I'm actually, I was just taking a look through the chat box right now and and there's a lot of the positive comments about the conversation and how important these topics are and, and I just I know Justin Manning had actually put a few comments in there as well thank you Justin um and I, I want to wrap up our call if that's all right with a question and this is a question I've been asking all our guests sorry recently and that's if there is one book that you would recommend to folks that are getting started well you know want to get a bit more financially literate or if there's something that you know personal development as it relates to finance is there a book that has changed the way you thought or you would recommend to others um elizabeth we'll start with you and then robin you can give us your your one book so i i like to support my girlfriends I like to support my friends all the time. And the one that I would talk to is Talk Money to Me, Kelly Keen. But Kelly has a new book right now, too, that's just come out, um, Rich Girl, Broke Girl. Come but on. I also like a really good friend of mine, Gail Vaz Oxlade, who is the queen of self-help books and personal finance books from 20 years ago. And uh, all her stuff still stands today. Awesome. All right. Well, those are three books there. I, I actually, I, I've read a bit of uh, Kelly Keene's book, uh, Talk Money to Me, but I know she's got the new one out there. I haven't read it yet, but definitely need to check it out. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was the top of my list too, right? I'm a big, I'm a big fan of Kelly. I think that she has, you know, she's got some, she always has very sound advice. So, you know, Talk Money to Me is up there on my list. Rich Girl, Broke Girl is another one. I think it's actually out on Indigo is, you know, one of the most anticipated books coming out. So that's definitely one you want to pick up. I also really like Melissa Leong. So, you know, Happy Go Money is a, another really great book. She was actually, so she's Canadian here. She actually was debuted on the, for the second time on the Drew Barrymore show yesterday. So another great Canadian, you know, personal finance. Um, I think that, you know, being in touch with different financial books is important to be able to give yourself some, some grounding and be able to sort of look forward. Um, I wouldn't shy away from, from some of the more, you know, I don't want to say advanced books, but looking at, you know, retirement books or looking at things that give you um, not just sort of the happiness around money or the generality around money, but the, you know, this is how you save into your RSP. You know, this is how you, you know, save into your RSP. So rock in your RSP is one out by Bruce Celery, which has been out, which is actually one of the gold standards of RSP savings. So, you know, look for Canadian authors, but look for authors that speak to you. You want to read books that you have interest in um, because then you'll be able to relate to them and you'll be able to put your own, your own strategies and, and savings and investing to work for you. So, you know, I guess at the end of this, you know, whether it's a book or an app or a show, engage engagement is key here so engage and find the authors that you like to converse with and again we have some really great canadian authors here so bruce Ellery, kelly keen and melissa leong would be my uh those would be my recommendations happy go money awesome happy go money yeah yeah no. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. There was so much to take away. And I really love the conversation about women and wealth for me personally. That was, that's a lot to take, like, I'm going to be taking away from this call. I hope everybody else on the call did as well. And for those of you who had to hop off or 
are still on and you'd like to watch the replay, we're going to have it on our Instagram live, um, our Instagram live se segment on our web uh, Instagram page. Got so many Instagrams. And uh, uh, the replay and all our articles, all our past Instagram lives are also on our financial advice for all website. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth, Robin, you folks take care. And we'll hopefully get to host you sometime soon. I look forward. Ladies, great to see you. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for having us. All right. Take, take care. Bye. Hope to see you all soon.